Good evening. Are you well? Fantastic. Hey, why don't you uh, why don't you turn to somebody as you take your seat and let them know that you are ready for the word. Fantastic. Good stuff. Well, are you well? You enjoying tonight so far? Everybody down here? How good is that? You guys are just ready to rush the stage. That's fantastic. So, uh, hey, look, tonight, um, as Amy introduced me, my name is Ryan Alcorn. It has been that way all of my life. I, um, I was born that way. Lady Gaga song. Uh, but tonight, I, I, I'm coming before you not as anyone with any kind of worship experience. Um, in fact, if I did that, I'm sure that the attendance would drop greatly next year, and I'm sure Dave and, uh, and Pastor Wayne, our senior pastor, wouldn't love that too much. So tonight I'm coming to you not as anyone with kind of any insight, with musical experience, but as a pastor's kid. Do we have any church kids in the house? Yeah. Where's my felt board fellowship? You know, you learn every Bible story on a felt board. Where are you at? Come on. You know that you've got, you got a quality systematic theology based on the quality of the felt that you had in your church. Come on. So I, I come to you tonight not as a worship leader, but as, but as a church kid. Somebody who grew up in a, in a pastor's house. My father is Pastor Wayne Alcorn here. And uh, I grew up in church. I had the pleasure of growing up as a pastor's kid. I grew up, you know, in and around church. And for me, you know, it was one of the greatest ple pleasures. It was one of the greatest joys that I've ever had, being able to grow up in, 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 in environments like this, growing up in and around things like Youth Alive, uh, growing up in and around amazing services like this. But to be honest, one of the greatest dangers of growing up as a church kid, as one of the felt board fellowship, is, is that spirit of Shania Twain. You know, there's, there's great danger as a church kid growing up and, and, and kind of having the spirit of Shania Twain come upon you. It's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that spirit that the moment that you walk into church after some kind of time and, 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 and that voice comes up, that don't impress me much. You know, like every service that you go in, you just sit back, you, you've got, you know, you don't come into church as anything other than a thermometer. You just come in, you just kind of gauge how church is going. You kind of come in, and, and, and everything is about, you know, whether or not that impresses me. And so tonight, I want to talk to you very, very quickly about the danger of familiarity. The, the danger of, of familiarity, and tonight, I want to encourage you. Tonight, I believe that for a number of people, we're going to rediscover our awe. Come on, we're, we're going to rediscover the wonder of God tonight. Can we do that? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, if you have your Bible with you, would you turn with me to Psalm 145, verse 1 to 8. It's always good when you get to quote a chapter of the Bible with three digits. It's rare. It's a novelty. It says this, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and, I will, and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Come on, does anybody believe that? His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious, the, the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of your power and your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Come on, how many people believe this? The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Tonight, I want to talk to you about living an awful life. Tonight, I want to talk to you about living an awe-filled life. Can we pray? Lord God, Father, I thank you that tonight as we speak, as we open your word, Lord God, as we look to what your scripture says about you, Lord, that you would do what only you could do, that your spirit would search uh, the, the, the unknown realms and make known to us the unknown. Lord God, I pray that the eyes of our hearts, every person in here, would be enlightened to see you. Lord God, that we would be able to see with a hope Lord God, that we would be able to, to see, Lord, with, with, with perspective and with power. Lord God, I pray that tonight we would come to know you in a new, deep, and fresh way. In the name of Jesus, we believe for it. And so in the name of Jesus, we receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
When I went to uni, I, um, I actually, you know, looking at me, you think, obviously, very learned. <laughs> but when I, 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 I graduated university with a bachelor in art. <laughs> That's right, I didn't even get the plural. <laughs> a bachelor in art. They weren't even generous enough to give me the S. So I, just, I, I, I studied uh, animation, I studied fine art at university. And um, on my first day at university, I, at my, my first day at art school, um, they, they handed me a piece of paper. My, my very first class yeah, at art school, they handed me a piece of paper and, um, and a crayon. And I thought, oh, come on. You know, this is a, this is a stigma that I'm not going to shake forever. I'm in, a, I'm in a house of teachers. My dad is a pastor. My mom's a teacher. My dad, uh, sorry, my brother um, tried to become a teacher, became a, a gym teacher. And then they said, you know what, let's forget it. Let's just make him head of sport. So everybody around me is kind of, is kind of smart. And in my first day at university, they hand me a piece of paper and a crayon. And I think, oh, no, this is, this is never going to shake. What they do is they hand me a piece of paper and, and, and a crayon. And they say, you know what, can you draw us a bike? And I thought, this is, this is some kind of class. So I sat down, myself, everybody else in my class, we sit down with our piece of paper. I had a green crayon. I don't know if, you know, that has any significance. But it was a green crayon, and I tried to draw a bike. And um, what was interesting is, you know, we see bikes a lot, don't we? You know, there's, you know, thank, thank God for those city bikes that just are so useful. <laughs> you know, everybody's second choice for, um, you know, really exhaustive public transport. The other one is walking or anything else. <laughs> but, you know, thank God they're there. It's important. And so, you know, we see bikes a lot. And so they say, you know what, draw us a bike. I think, oh, come on, I can do this. Grab my crayon, having drawn with a crayon for, you know, at least a week. So I scribble my, 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 my drawing down. I draw two circles, kind of connect them. It's got two pedals, maybe a chain there somewhere, some handles. And, um, you know, I finish and, and I think, you know what, I've done pretty well. And then they, they flash up on the screen a picture of a bike. And I look at that picture of a bike. Can I just say this, though? I'm not great on bikes. I, um, I've fallen off three bridges. I've run into two poles. And one Christmas, I just thought, you know what? There's not enough going on here today. So I just ran a motorbike straight into a barbed wire fence. I'm not great on bikes. So maybe my brain was suppressing, you know, the, the, the image of a bike. But they flash up on the screen an image of a bike. And what I'm looking at, their description of a bike, which they call a photograph, was very different to my interpretation of this bike. Basically, what they do this exercise to prove to you is that in visual theory, in, in, in visual kind of theory, there's this thought called visual lethargy, which means that the more you see something, the, the less you actually see it. The more you see something, the less you actually see it. And so they say, you know what? They, they, take, it, they take the bike off the screen, they tell you, you know what, try and remember your very first bike. You know, flashback, I'm like, I'm there. You know, red Melvin star, <sighs> and fast. So I thought, how am I going to translate fast into this crayon picture? But, but I drew something, and, and, and to my amazement, just before they flashed it up, to my amazement, after I thought about that first bike that I had, it actually looked surprisingly closer to a bike, because, because the first time that we look at something, we really take it in, don't we? We really take it in. Think of the first time that you moved into the suburb that you're in. You know, you're, you're, you're searching for houses. You're doing the thing. The first drive into the street, you're looking at all of the trees. The sun's filtering through. It's just that perfect time of day that, you know, the haze from all of the inner city traffic is just, you know, enough to kind of really catch the light but not enough to choke you. And it's, you know, and it's perfect. And, and you look at the street and it's, it's amazing. It's perfect. And then two weeks later, you're in that same street. The street that took your breath away, the street that said, you know what, this is the street that I'm going to live in. That same street, two weeks later, you're just honking your horn thinking, I can't get out of this thing quick enough. And then by the 20th, 100th time that you're driving down that street, you don't remember what that street looks like. You just remember kind of blacking out the moment that you get close enough to home. You just put it on autopilot and you're there. Bang. We experience visual lethargy in our physical world, but I would also suggest that there's a danger for everybody that, that has followed Christ for any length of time. There's a danger for us to experience a spiritual lethargy. There, there, those of us that have grown up in and around church, those of us that have been 
following Jesus for any length of time, especially those of us that are on rosters week in, week out, having to serve it, having to, having to do the things that are important to get church done, but, 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 but just are there around it all of the time, that there is a danger of us experiencing a spiritual lethargy, that the more that we see God, the more that we've experienced God, the more that every day we, we encounter, we, we enjoy church, we have the danger of forgetting to see the one who put all of this into motion. And tonight, I want to encourage you that if you are here tonight and you are experiencing a kind of spiritual lethargy, tonight is the night for you to turn and run straight back to your Savior. It's time for you to return. Think back to the first time that you experienced His grace. Think back to the first time that you experienced that blessing of life that comes with the grace of God, freely received through faith. Tonight, you can reclaim your wonder. So tonight... We, we, we open with Psalm 145, and, and we, we, we see this amazing psalm. And, and, and it's amazing, and it's awesome, and it's so awe-filled. You know, David was, David was quite, you know, a songbird. He was a good worship leader. For those of you that are here, you know, if there's somebody to aspire to, David's good. You know, he's a good one. You know, he, w- he would have been on the PCO rosters quite a bit. He's, you know, he's probably the highest-selling artist of all time. He's, he's, you know, he's done well. You know you've done well as a worship leader when your lyrics are impressed into a mug at Kurong. <laughs> you know, if, if we're to kind of establish tonight, we're just going to take sidebar. If we're going to establish tonight the measure of success here on earth, obviously we know. If we're going to, if we're going to establish the measure of success, it's that some great auntie has your lyrics on a doily somewhere in her house. <laughs> David has achieved success. David's on doilies, he's on the back of doors, he's on the back of toilet doors because everybody knows that sometimes it's sinful what goes on in there and you just need to be reminded of the Lord. <laughs> you know, how, why do we continue to put... Anyway. <laughs> David is this incredible, incredible writer. And we open, we, we, we read in this, in this psalm, we see that, you know what, that... that you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open with this. I'm going to say, I will exalt you, my God and my King. David begins this psalm with a self-charge that, you know what, I will do this. I, I've got something to do, and I'm going to do it. And then, and then he kind of begins. Come on, we're here tonight because we want to praise God. Is that right? If you're not here for that, the donuts will be great. But, but for the majority of us here... Those of us that weren't just kind of given the old bait and switch, you know, come tonight, have dinner, and then, oh, no, we're in one car. Welcome to church. <laughs> For those of you, welcome. There will be donuts after. But, but David pens this psalm, and it's a psalm of awe. It's a psalm that the, the whole, the overriding narrative of this entire psalm is just a, 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 a psalm, a song of awe. And, and, and he kind of does this thing that's so incredible that, that that David pens this psalm in what could kind of almost be described as an environment much like tonight you read it there, 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 there's there's so much going on around him you know one generation's there commending to another there's there's people there that are speaking hey eh? there there's people that are telling there's people that are proclaiming there's people that are celebrating there are people that are joyfully singing David seems like he pens this psalm in the midst of just like a cranking worship service. David, he he, he does all of this stuff in the midst of an incredible kind of awe-filled environment. But what I love about this psalm is that even though David was surrounded by awe, he says this, when, when we read that they will speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty, he says, and I will meditate. David shows us in this psalm that it can be very easy to be surrounded with awe and forget to be filled with awe. David shows us that we as people on worship teams can spend our days surrounded by people celebrating, surrounded by people just proclaiming, by people telling of the good news. He, he, he shows us that we can be surrounded by awe but not filled with it. And I think that there's a great danger in, in, in everybody. Everybody that is continually surrounded, much like the children of Israel, 
We read about they leave Egypt. Then for months, maybe years, some, some scholars would suggest 40 years, they are, they, they're guided by a pillar of cloud. They're guided by a, you know, a, a stack of fire just in the night, which is rad. Every day for 40 years, they're given manna from heaven. Every day, they, they, they receive the presence of God in the cloud. They receive the protection of God in the fire. And they receive the provision of God in the manna. But what happens? These people are surrounded by the things of God. And yet only a few chapters into all of this, they begin to make idols in their own way. If we don't decide to be filled ourselves with the awe of God, we begin to praise ourselves. We begin to turn things inwards on ourselves. We begin to praise that which we create. And I think David gives us such an incredible insight to what we have to do. That that even though we can be surrounded by awe, we can miss being filled with awe. And the charge I want to take tonight is perhaps there are people here that find themselves continually going through the motions of just getting church done. And God bless you because people, whether you feel it or not, are encountering the goodness and grace of God. And you may not feel like, you know, it's, it's popping this way and that, but you're diligently serving and God bless you for that. But what I want to... C- what I want to charge you, what I want to encourage you with tonight is that even though you feel as though you are just getting on with the grind and you're just doing the things, you're, you're creating environments of awe, don't just be surrounded by awe. Take it upon yourself. Internalize it. Meditate on it. Make sure that you stop and take stock of the wonder of God surrounding you. We have a God that is most worthy to be praised. We've got a God that is rich in love and slow to anger. We've got a God that is so gracious. We've got a God that inhabits the praises of, your, of His people, which is you. We've got a God worthy of praise. We've got a God who is awesome, who is fantastic, who is magnificent, who, whose glory resounds through the ages. We've got to take stock. We can be surrounded by His presence. We can be surrounded by His protection. We can be surrounded by His provision. But we, like the Israelites, can fall into the trap of forgetting that He's there. What so often happens is when we lose the awe of God, we quickly replace it with an awe of ourselves, with the things that we create. What do the Israelites do? Every day. I don't, I, I, and, I, and I like to think that perhaps it didn't just kind of happen one day that they just lost sight. You can almost hear the conversations as we kind of get to this point of losing sight of the provider, of the protector, in, you know, of the presence. You know, I, I don't think that it was just day dot, you know, that, you know, pff, fire's there. You know, that wasn't there before. Great job. I don't think it would have just been like, you know, at day 40, they just said, oh, let's just forget that God's there. You can almost hear the conversations that led to this point of them losing sight of God. Perhaps one day they were just kind of walking down and... I don't know, Chad, just because Chad sounds like the kind of name, the guy that would do it. (laughs) Chad was there, just finished CrossFit. It's like, cloud's smaller today. You know, cloud, I feel like the cloud was bigger yesterday. Man, that fire's late, you know. Everybody knows the fire starts at six. Three songs in. Fire's not here. Man, you know what? This naan, this manna, it's all right. Could use some garlic, though. <laughs> Maybe a spread. Cheesy Mite 2.0. <laughs> I don't think they just decided to lose sight of God. I think there were conversations that happened that led them to the point that they became so enamored with the gifts of God that they forgot the giver. And I think for us as people that are constantly surrounded by the things of God, we got to watch the conversations that we have. we got to watch that we're not enamored by the things that God is giving, that we lose sight of He is the one that we're actually there for. Come on, when God turns up, when His presence comes into the building, we shouldn't be thinking, man, it's not popping this week. 
We should be thinking, man, God is here. Oh my word, he has entered the building. Come on, when God's protection comes through, we read those, those amazing reports of people being healed of cancer because our God is a healing God. When we begin to read those praise reports, when we begin to read the fact that, man, I thought that I was going this way, but God, he spoke to me and I ended up over here. We can't forget the fact that, come on, that's just not, oh, there was more praise reports last week. We cannot let ourselves be so surrounded by the glory and presence and majesty of God that we forget to be filled with it. Come on, the wonder, the wonder of God, the wonder of God should shape our very existence. The wonder of God should shape our thoughts, our actions, it should shape our moods. When we look at God and we recognize Him for Him, it should change the way we live. In ministry, the, the, the awe of God, when we stop and like David, even though we're hearing all of the things, we stop and take stock of who God is, it should be the thing that drives us to the pulpit. We should be as ministers, people that are in pursuit of filling others with the awe of God. That, that people, Jesus came that he might restore the awe of God. He might restore the very glory of God back in the earth. He said that I want to establish your kingdom here on earth. What is the kingdom of God? It is his kingdom of glory. It's his kingdom of awe and wonder and amazement at God who, who decided that, you know what? I'm going to take on a face like yours so that you can know me. It's, it's, it's a God who says that, you know what, I ideally want to hunt you down and cover you with my grace. We cannot lose sight of the awe and the wonder of God. The awe of God should be the thing that, that, that pushes us into worship, that propels us into singing. The awe of God should be the thing that drives us to praise Him with the zipper, with the lute, with the lyre, with the timbrel. I don't know. Do you guys have a timbrel? That would be awesome. It's, it's the wonder of God. It's those moments that we stop and we consider Him for Him. It's those moments that when we hear praise reports, we stop and consider the fact that we've got a God that would actually stop what He's doing and inhabit what we've asked Him to do. We've got a God that wants to actually enter our lives and make a difference. We can't take that for granted. Come on, can we be people filled with the awe of God? The awe of God should be what pushes us to give our gifts and our talents. The wonder of grace is what plants us in humility. That when we consider that he who knew no sin became sin so that we should know the righteousness of God, we can't have pride. When we, when we stop and we consider Jesus... When we place ourselves in, in, in a position of wonder about grace, it, produ it produces a tenderness in us that says, you know what, we all have an equal claim to the foot of the cross. I can't, I can't sit there with angry fingers and tell you that you need to shape up or, sh or, 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 or get out. It's a right view of God that produces a kind, tender-hearted nature towards everyone that God has created. Can we be a people that, that pursue the wonder of grace, that gives us a passion, that, that, that makes us feel like, you know what, it's not how I'm received, but it's that I've been received in Him. Can we pursue a wonder of grace that, that produces a boldness, a rest, a peace, a joy? Can we be people that actively pursue the wonder of God? Second Peter 1 verse 12 to 18, it says this. So I will always remind you of these things. What's he talking about? He's talking about the grace, the calling, the power of God for believers. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Side note, he's basically saying, God told me I'm going to die pretty horrific death. Um, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses 
Come on, do we have any eyewitnesses in the house? I was eyewitnesses to his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Peter says, I will constantly remind you of him. I know that you can so easily lose sight. I know that you doing ministry can so easily become so lethargic to the, to the wonder of God. So I'm going to remind you constantly. I'm going to remind you constantly of him, of Jesus. The call, the grace, the power, the holiness to, he, to that which he's called you. Because why? I cannot move past the glory of your majesty. Peter says, you know what? I'm not here with fancy words. I'm just here flat out gobsmacked by the goodness and grace and glory of our God. Peter is driven to ministry. Not by process, not by procedure, but by an absolute breathtaking encounter with the living, loving God. I don't think anyone here was driven to do what perhaps you do in your church because of great systems. I don't think anybody was so amazed with Elvanto or PCO that you're like, oh man, it makes it so easy to serve, so I'll serve. It just like, it, it knows me. Knows my availability. If I put it in, please put it in. I don't think anybody... I don't think anybody thought, you know what, I'm so stirred up to serve because of this incredible system, the, these, these, these cleverly devised stories. I didn't follow God into ministry because of the systems. I came because I was blown away by the glory of God when I encountered Him. Come on, can we get back to that place that drew us into ministry, that, that, that took a hold of our heart, that, 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 that lit us on fire to, to say, you know what, forgetting everything that's behind, I press on towards the goal. I, I say, you know what, I'm going to give up my Sundays. I'm going to give up my Fridays. Not because there is a great place for me to serve, but because there is one worth serving. Come on, can we be a people that decide, I have a God that is so wonderful, so amazing, so divine, that I, I can't do anything but decide to pursue Him. Come on, Peter. Peter never got over it. Peter never got over the transfiguration. He never graduated from the awe of God. He never progressed past being blown away by a God that would want to meet with us. He never matured through that phase of just being stopped in worship. Peter saw some incredible things. Just read the book of Acts. Peter saw some amazing things, but that thing that just that just held him in place, that in light of just, you know, what he knew to be a pretty rough end, the thing that held him in place was the majesty of God, the wonder of His presence. May we never lose sight of the wonder of Jesus. May we never lose sight of His majesty. Come on, so many of us, we want the fire, but we forget the fuel. So many of us, we want you know, we want the service to be popping. We want all the hands raised. You know, when the interlude kind of builds, we want, we want the tingles, but sometimes I feel as though we maybe lose sight of the presence that produces the fruit. Come on, we want the fire, but let's not forget the fuel. The wonder of God. The wonder of God. 
let's not become such professional Christians that we lose our personal awe. May we never become such professional worship leaders that we forget to just be enamored by His presence when we begin to sing. May we never just become such incredible BVs that we forget that it's His voice that hears us. May we never become such just professional musicians that we forget that we are actually an, a, a, a entertaining the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That we actually have held in place the, the God of majesty, of wonder. That we have an audience of one, the King, the Lord, the Prince, the one who was and is to come. May we be people that every time we stand on a platform, every time we stand in our seats, every time we lift our hands, we raise our voice, we recognize that it's not for us, it's not for systems, it's not for any clever reason. The reason that we come, the reason that we have arrived at this place is the majesty, the wonder, the grace, the love, the peace, the joy, the healing, the, the, the goodness, the holiness. Come on, it is God and God alone. May we never lose sight of Jesus. May we never lose sight of Jesus. Come on. May we like John the Baptist, and I love this story. John the Baptist had probably the most high achieving cousin of all time. You know that, that person in your family that's just that high achiever. They're just like every Christmas, it's like, oh, tell me more about Glenn. John the Baptist grew up cousin of Jesus. Every year for like 30 years, he would have had to have sat through, you know, meals where it's like, oh, John, what are you doing? Oh, I'm eating locusts. Cool. Jesus is the son of God. <laughs> have you heard about Jesus? There are a few people at this point that were as close to Jesus as John the Baptist. But what I love about John the Baptist, what I hope can be the heart cry of every person in this room, that no matter how long you've been following Jesus, no matter how close you feel like you are to Jesus, no matter how long you feel like you've been doing the things, what I hope that we can get is that spirit of John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus walking down toward the beach, he says, behold the Son of God. Behold the Son of God, behold the Lamb that was slain, who has come to wash away the sins of the world. Can we be like John the Baptist, that every time we come to see the grace, the glory, the love of God anywhere in our world, we, we decide, I'm not going to be surrounded by God, but I'm going to be filled with God. I'm not going to be surrounded by His love, but I'm going to be filled with His love. And may we, like John the Baptist, decide that every time we see Jesus coming. We say, look at that. Look at that, man. That's grace. Look at Jesus. He's the only one that could save me. Look at that. That's, that's the thing we've been waiting for. That's, well, that's the thing I was waiting for. He's the only thing that can lift that spirit of apathy, that can lift that spirit of over-familiarity. He's the only one that can, in fact, Himself place in us a spirit of awe and wonder. The Bible says that He, His Spirit comes and, and reveals the unsearchable, unknowable parts of God. All I know is that we need to be filled with the awe and wonder of His majesty. I, I'm sorry, but I don't have a five-step solution to to what I'm talking about. All I know is that you can run to the cross. That, that, that like that first time I drew, when I, when I thought about my first bike, it became so much clearer. All I know is that we can always return to our first love. That, that, that if you feel dry, if you feel like, you know what, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. It's become a clever system. Run to the foot of the cross. Run to the empty tomb. Run to the realization that He promised that He will pour His flesh out upon all people. You're all standing already. I can delete that from my notes. Tonight is not just a night to simply be near God. Come on, is anybody ready to not just be near God, but fill with God? Come on, is anybody ready not just to be surrounded, but filled? 
Worship teams, I believe that tonight you're going to be refilled with the awe of God. I believe that tonight you're going to be, you're going to encounter and just rediscover that thing that pushes you. That people that just feel like they're writing empty lyrics would be once again have their eyes, the eyes of their heart just enlightened so that they can begin to sing forth new songs. That they can begin to look at new aspects of His love and His majesty. I just want to pray this. If everybody wants to open their hands, we're about to sing. Oh, man, we're about to sing. If everybody across this room just wants to open their hands out in front of them. I just want to pray this prayer. It's in Ephesians. And it says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Come on, people's eyes are going to be open so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people and His incomparably great power. Wait for it. For us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and He seated Him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the name, in the one to come. And God placed all things, all things under His feet. You might feel like tonight you've, you've lost sight of God. You might feel like things are coming up. They, they're over you tonight. God has placed all things under the feet of the one that He appointed to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Come on, worship together. Can we praise God? Can we worship God? Can we look at God? Can we discover God? Come on, let's begin to sing this song as we run to the cross. 